And I'd like to introduce our final speaker today is Doug Wilson. Doug's with the Ocean and Coastal Observing Virgin Islands, or Okove, and, and today he'll be talking about the Northeastern Caribbean um, and specifically focusing on Hurricane Dorian and some of the essential ocean features in, in the region there. And Doug, I'll pull up your presentation here and go ahead and start when you're ready. Okay. And I'll point to it on my screen with my cursor that nobody else can see. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so when I say over here, I'll be uh, making references to that. Anyway. Um, so yes, I'm gonna talk about essential ocean features and uh, there's some Hurricane Dorian in here as well. Um, in fact, this picture on the right is, the, uh, is an image of Hurricane Dorian, which essentially uh, formed an eye over the north coast of uh, St. Thomas, uh, as you can see here on August 28th of last year. Um, our glider, uh, we did have quite a few gliders in the area, and you'll see that. Contributors here, uh, Okovi, which is essentially uh, Karakus in the U.S. Virgin Islands, um, Rutgers, um, and I can't see it, but along the bottom, there's a lot of other contributors, including uh, we owe a great debt of, uh, to NOAA AOML for their support, and um, from 2018, the uh, NAVO for, for gliders. So next slide. Okay. So why are we measuring in this region? Well, it's a critical upstream measurement point along the, on the hurricane alley that leads, you know, through the tropical Atlantic to the U S coast. Um, the essential ocean features, and we've seen this slide on the right a few times. We've got two of them that we're dealing with. One is this larger warm North Atlantic uh, tropical warm pool. Um, and it's a region of, of significant and, as you'll see, increasing upper ocean heat content. And then in this far eastern, northeastern side, we've uh, talked about the heat and freshwater inflow um, that comes into the region and um, really makes that essential. Uh, the process is the, is the inflow, but the feature that you see is that uh, often the salinity based uh, enhanced stratification in the upper layer. And so in the last few years, uh, we've developed capability through support from NOAA and Rutgers for glider operations um, in Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. And this is what you're gonna see here today. Next. Okay, you can click again, it's gonna start this, uh, yeah, much slower than it should be picture of uh, never used live presentations um, of total kinetic energy from satellite altimetry. And that just gives you an idea of the, um, the energy and, in this case, the advection of warm water, uh, warm, low salinity water that comes up from the South American coast that actually runs really fast if you're on the computer. Um, so this whole region is significant because it's typically, as we saw, included in the Atlantic warm pool. Um, with the accompanying connections to the Atlantic uh, multi-decadal oscillation and hurricane activity. It's also a proximate mean boundary between the subtropical and tropical um, gyres. And that boundary moves north and south seasonally and changes the impact in the region from northern gyre to southern uh, freshwater input. So that's significant. It's also historically undersampled by upper ocean profiles. And because of that, as we'll see, it's potentially quite poorly represented by climatology and ocean models. And particularly those that are that's relevant in ocean models that we use for hurricane forecasts. And then this transport of heat and fresh water and the resulting impacts on the upper ocean vertical temperature, salinity, and density structure are the essential ocean of process that defines the region. Um, so you see on the left here is the mean sea surface temperature for that North Atlantic warm pool. Uh, that's based on the extended reconstructed SST. And I'm looking at the Caribbean region and the smaller uh, Puerto Rico Virgin Island region. This is the long term data um, with sort of a Caribbean uh, multi decadal oscillation calculated in the same way as the Atlantic. Uh, superimposed, and you can see that 
for both the wider region and that northeastern region that uh, we are in the midst of a fairly strong increase in sea surface temperature, uh, 0 0.25, 0 0.25 degrees for the wider Caribbean, 0 0.03 for the, uh, for the northeastern Caribbean. I think if you hit another return, I get another picture on this one, okay? So this shows the trends and, and what you can see is, uh, A is, is the top picture is, is all months and you can see the increase primarily in the Eastern Caribbean. And then if we just look at hurricane season, that is even stronger. So those are interesting trends. We see a little more of that um, if we look a little deeper. Next slide. So this is tropical cyclone heat potential. People have talked about that before. The, uh, the heat in the upper ocean above 26 degrees C. Um, the two that you see here, again, same data. Well, this is actually from the uh, WOD 18 because we get the, the surface uh, profiles. But um, the picture on the top left is the uh, July, September through September mean over the five decades. Um, and the lower picture is actually a trend, and you can see there's several interesting areas of uh, increasing upper ocean heat content. Um, for what it's worth, they sort of happen to be located at, at bathymetric choke points in the region, which is something that's interesting. But we also have a, a little minimum or a smaller maximum, I guess, in the uh, northeastern Caribbean. And so if we plot some of those up, um, the upper right hand graph shows um, tropical cyclone heat potential here again for those decadal averages. This is July through October. Um, and you can see that that number has increased over the last 40 to 50 years by almost a factor of one and a half uh, from, you know, this mean of around 40 to uh, now we're up around 65. If we look just in that upper right hand corner, that Puerto Rico Virgin Island region that we saw, um, we see it increase even faster. It's even, it's uh, maybe the high 40s here, but it's uh, low 80s here. These little X's plus signs on the right are the values that we got from our 2018 data, uh, glider data. Um, this point way up here is uh, from data that you're also gonna see in 2019, where we saw in September, October, values uh, of around 110, which is uh, tremendously high. Um, one of the interesting things here, I mentioned that these were poorly sampled. These are numbers of uh, points in that database. It's, you know, we're in the hundreds here, 600. Suddenly in the 2000s, we drop into the 40s and 30s. Um, this is really important because we're now adding as you've seen, and you'll see again, you know, we're adding tens of thousands of profiles <laughs> for gliders. And so that's changing the, the picture that we have of the region. Um, this, is, this is actually caused, I think, by a slowdown of Navy activity in the, in the region. Next slide. So in uh, 2018, we got into this game through the uh, supply, the NAVO supplying five gliders that were launched out of the university or out of the Virgin Islands. We had help from uh, Okovi, Caracuz, and the University of the Virgin Islands. It's been a great tool for engaging students. Um, a lot of these people have gone to Rutgers, gone to AOML for training, gone over to Puerto Rico and engaged in the launch activities there. And again, in 2018, we went from, you know, almost no profiles in the region to around 12,000. Um, these were Navy um, uh, Slocum gliders that were doing 200 meter profiles. Next. So speeding through this, here's some of the data from that. Again, when you're doing the 200 meter profiles, we got really nice uh, temporal resolution of some of the features. Um, this is one of those that was in the Virgin Island Basin. I'm pointing now over on the right. And you really see the increase in uh, upper layer salinity. I mean, we've seen that in some of the other gliders before, but this is the impact of the, uh, of the water coming, South American uh, river water coming up and entering the region. 
Um, so you see how it increased here a couple parts per thousand, and it really, uh, as you'll see, uh, strengthens this, this upper ocean density gradient. Um, one of the really cool features that you see also, for instance, look at the uh, bottom of the thermocline up in the top picture are these, uh, uh, these are ubiquitous when you see, when you have these strong uh, picnic lines here, but uh, you see these uh, semi-diurnal internal waves. Uh, this has been of interest to some of the folks in the Virgin Islands studying mesophotic coral reefs at the shelf break because they see these same oscillations impacting uh, what goes on there. Um, semi-diurnal oscillations at around the same depth of uh, one or two degrees C and one or two parts per thousand. Next. Um, one of the interesting things that we found, I mean, thinking about the processes that lead to these uh, stratification features is that in a comparison, um, a bulk comparison of uh, transport between this glider uh, and the, this NG 467 in this region to the Goffs model is that not only did we not get the uh, heat transport right, we completely had the wrong sign. And so that's something that we really want to look at. Uh, how do we get the models to better uh, represent the, the behavior of that feature or that process? Next. So this is what we did in 2019. Um, this now shows all of the gliders that AOML had out, those are the red ones in conjunction with, uh, with Caracou's. And this red one, the triangle on the southeastern side, which was uh, Okobi AOML uh, collaboration. Um, one of the tracks that I'm going to show, SG665, that uh, was able to capture some of uh, Dorian as it came through. And then this uh, sort of dark red uh, polygon over on the right, which was our foray into the further northeastern Caribbean, again, to look at the, if we can get a little upstream and look at the impact of uh, how those features evolve in the region. Um, next. This is one of those tracks. It's probably going to go slowly, but um, I think the significance of this, again, is we are working upstream and we were able to do, um, this was an international mission. And so we went through the full marine science research uh, application process and we worked in both uh, US and British Virgin Island and Anguilla waters. Um, it also was a, a nifty trick of glider piloting. Um, this bank you see in the middle that we are working around goes from about 1,500 meters to about 10 meters, and we uh, had a nice time avoiding that. So let's go ahead and step through that because it's too slow. And these are some of the results. Again, you see that strong um, upper ocean density gradient that's formed between the south uh, water, the Fresh water from the south, and then it's sandwiched in the upper layer above the subtropical underwater, which really forms that uh, tight uh, density gradient. You can see that over on the right. Next, trying to move fast. Um, this is where we looked at uh, Maria Aristazabal, who uh, at Rutgers did some work looking at uh, Dorian's passage through the region. We looked at uh, Sea Glider 665, which is this uh, vertical section on the right. So next, how well did we uh, capture that? And in particular, um, how well did the models do with the upper ocean um, structure? Um, this is just looking at how well the model did in general with uh, capturing the uh, processes that uh, that lead to that structure. So you can see there um, salinity, or essentially in the upper ocean, color as a proxy for salinity uh, in the satellite and then in the model as well. Next. And again, this is, uh, this is a various um, representations of the upper ocean track that shows 665 glider. Um, whether we look at the definition of a thermocline as a uh, 
defined by temperature or if we use density because of the uh, impact of salinity on that. And you can see here the uh, GOS 3.1, it underrepresent the salinity, but it does a pretty good job of getting the, uh, the locations correct and the various other models um, have various other degrees of, of uh, ability to simulate that. Next. So what are we gonna do next? Um, this is showing the, our 2021 plans. Um, some of you may remember that I spent a number of years in the 1990s looking to, uh, looking to work on how well models fit the actual observed transport in this region. That's over here on the left. We have a plan now supported by Rutgers and the Vetlison Foundation to be, do an international glider challenge mission um, that will do both the Anagata Passage that we did last year and then work its way down through the islands um, and try to uh, estimate. Look at the transport, look at the models. This uh, next newest iteration of uh, RU-29 is gonna have a, a new uh, Nortec 82 cp velocity profiler, so we expect to be able to get good um, estimates of velocity and leading to transport in the region. So final slide is basically just a thank you, and I want everybody to go to Okovi YouTube, just type that in, and take a look at the terrific uh, movie that we made of our 2019 uh, activities, and thank you all.